and go. Thank you. Um, so um, just a kind of a little bit of background. I'm, um, I'm a college English professor. And um, this has always been areas that I was fascinated with the early medieval, I mean, the early Renaissance and medieval literature. And I especially started looking at it as far as how it looked, um, how it looked at women, how, um, how the idea of women is, was formed by what other people had to say um, about them because they didn't have the voice to talk about themselves as much. And so as I was reading through things, I found certain uh, literary works that, um, certain literary works that would have men writing them, but they would really have um, a, an incredible sense of who women really were. And so that's kind of where my interest in this came from. And so um, the first thing I wanna say about this is that is that the Decameron is something called a frame tale. And that means that it's a story that is framed on either end uh, by an overarching storyline of something that happened. And then within that story, you have this, the shorter stories that are told by individual people. And there are quite a few of these that are out there um, and, and they're very, very well known um, you, the, the Canterbury Tales is a frame tale. Um, a Thousand and One Nights is a frame tale. The Heptameron is a frame tale. And um, so it was a popular format. Um, so uh, that's just a little bit about what, what this story is. Um, it, the Decameron in specifically is considered one of the most important pieces of Italian classical prose. And it had a really important influence on Europe because in part, because it um, was the beginning of the use of vernacular writing, um, which is the native language rather than formal writing or, or, or writing in Latin. Um, the Decameron shows both tragic and comic views of life as you go through it. And, um, the, um, it shows the distinction between historical periods are arbitrary as well because it shows medieval aspects and early Renaissance aspects within the stories and, and the way it's written. Um, so the master theme, I guess you could say, is that, that um, Boccaccio wanted to describe um, the way of life of the refined bourgeoisie. Uh, the, and these people combined a respect for conventions with an open-minded attitude towards personal behaviors. And so they, they wanted to keep things um, as the way they had always been, that you know they had certain conventions that they lived by, but people could do things on the outside that they, um, that they, uh, uh, excuse me, people could do things that weren't within those conventions and they were more open-minded about it. So um, what he does in this is he offers realism. And so I wanna talk for just a minute uh, about the setting um, before we get into the stories. Um, the setting of the Decameron um, is during the plague in 1348 that, that really decimated so many areas. Um, what he offers in his introduction is a realism of what was going on in the plague. And so this, this um, description of the plague is important because of the information it gives us about human behavior. Um, and it shows an altered human moral behavior during this adversity, the way people behave um, in an in a emergency, the way people behave in, in something like this kind of ties into things that are going on. Um, as we've gone through this pandemic, we've seen so much of the good of people, but we've also seen um, the bad. And um, so it shows uh, this altered human moral behavior. There's a willingness to persecute um, foreigners. Um, there is a uh, ostracism of the sick, sick, a harsh ostracism of the sick. I'm sorry, 
I'm talking over myself. Um, there's a self-imposed exile of the healthy where they remove themselves from the sick so that they themselves wouldn't get sick. Um, they're, they're, they abandon loved ones and family and there is an indifference towards the, the lower class who were affected more strongly than the upper class. And so a lot of these things kind of ring through my mind when I think of, of again, when I think of things that have been, happened in the pandemic now and how so much that changes, so much still stays, stays the same. Um, the, he also mentions the deterioration of social institutions, such as medical institutions from being overrun um, with, with patients, religious, public health, and so on. Um, they, uh, their inability, not not lack of desire, but their inability to do the things that they should be able to do is part of what led to the uh, progress of the disease. And um, just, just to note that, that part of what I just said was a quote um, from Maestra Simone de Bourbonnet. And I wanted to make sure that I um, reference that because it's a, it's a really good comment on, on what was happening there and it really relates to what's happening now. So the frame of this, of, of the Decameron is seven young, I'm sorry, 10 young people found themselves in a church um, in, in Florence and they are trying to decide what to do. Um, they um, want to avoid the plague. So they decide to band together and they include the gentlemen to help protect the ladies. And they're going to travel the countryside to, to visit each other's um, estates so that they could be away from the city, which is where the plague was so, so prevalent. And um, so to avoid boredom, they selected a king or a queen for the day. And that king or queen would order the theme of the day as far as the storytelling. They would decide what the focus of the stories would be. And each person would then tell a story on that theme. So you have 10 people by 10 days, and that's 100 tales. Um, and these are generally concerned with the theme of love in one form or another. Um, but they also have other themes that they address, love, sex, friendship, uh, religion, class, um, social status, and, and, and those sorts of things. So they, um, they decide to tell these stories as they go day by day. And the way it happens, the order, the a day in the life, is that in the evening, the king or queen for the next day is selected. They will decide all of the day's activities, how the time will be spent, when they'll do their daily walks, what they'll talk about, the dances and the songs, and most importantly, that focus of the stories. The day ends with, song, with a song and dancing. Um, the mood of the group changes according to the story themes. So if they are, if, if it's a, if it's an unhappy or, or, or sad theme, the, the mood changes and the, and the interactions between the different people change. And if it's not, um, then the, if it's a happy theme or a funny theme, then, then people are more upbeat. Okay. Um, let's see. I, I have to apologize. I told Tatiana that um, I, I'm pulling together my notes because um, I couldn't get into my school account where, where all of my original stuff is. Um, so let me let me talk about the two stories that I'm going to talk about. Um, when I said love and lust in the Decameron, I'm focusing on two different stories. So one of them is from the third um, the third day, and it's the tenth novel. Um, which is the last story told of the day. And that's the story of lust. Um, th that's the story of um, Alabek and Rustico. And Alabek um, was a young girl and she went, um, she, does, she was not Christian, but she was drawn to the Christian life and she wanted to learn to become a Christian. And she had heard that the monks were the best people to go to for that kind of information. So she traveled very far by herself and she was only, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't remember, 12 or 14, very young, probably 14. Um, but she, um, she traveled very far by herself. She left her family home and um, 
she went to find monks and went to find hermits who could who could teach her about Christianity and teach her about God. Well, so she goes and she finds the first one and he looks at this beautiful young girl who wants him to teach her and he and he thinks to himself, oh no, uh -uh, that that's trouble getting ready to happen. And so he feeds her and he says she might want to go on and go to the next one. Um, and so then she um, goes on to the next one and this is Rustico. And Rustico is a young monk who has um, been praying and, and keeping himself holy and, and, and all of the things he is supposed to do. And he sees her and um, she asks if, if she can stay and he can teach her. And she, he, he's not too sure about it at first, but then he says, yes, we can. Um, and so he, he makes a bed for her, lays her down, covers her up and sits and he looks at her um, and watches her. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to um, open up, uh, share my screen, and it's going to have the little story of this interaction so that you can see it while I, while I talk along with it. Because he teases her, he fools her, not teases, he fools her um, into having sex with him as a way of defending a uh, defending God as a way of serving God. And so I want you to actually see the words rather than just have me tell them to you. So if you give me just a minute, I will share that screen. Well, I love too many. No, that's not what I was looking for, sorry. Okay, that's the one I want. There it is. Okay, so, um, so if y'all can see this, this is, um, he said that the way that they could serve God would be to put the devil in hell. And um, let me go past this. There we go up to the top and we'll kind of read through it. Um, so she um, she went to Rustico and he, like he said, he made a bed for her and, and told her to sleep there. And once it was done and not long before um, the temptations began to battle, it was not long before he began to be tempted. And so he thought about what he could do and um, then he, he just he couldn't stand it anymore so it says leaving aside the thoughts of holiness and the prayers and his discipline um he just he thought what could he do to take advantage of her sexually um so at first he asked questions and she discovered that she was a virgin she had never known a man and um so she never she didn't know about a man what a man's body looked like and he, then he thought of this clever way to take advantage of his pleasure as a way of serving god so first he told her a lot about how um how the devil was god's enemy and that the and that the people of god needed to fight the devil and um and then that would be pleasing to god that would make god happy um and so when she asked him how this was done um and he replied, you will soon find out, just do as I show. So he began to take his clothes off and she took her clothes off and then they knelt down facing each other. And so then as he was there um, in the throes of his desire and seeing her as beautiful as she was, the resurrection of the flesh came to him. And when Alabek saw it, she was amazed and said, Rustico, what is that thing that I see sticking out there, which I do not have? And that's about the nicest way to say, say that that I can think of. And one of the reasons that I love these and I love these stories is, is the, the, way, the way that things are said, the way that they talk about what's, um, what's happening. So he says, my child, this is the devil. Do you see? He is giving me so much trouble right now that I can hardly stand it. Um, and so then she said, um, I'm in better condition than you because I don't have a devil. And he says, oh, no, you have something else, though, that's more important. And she says, what's that? And he said, 
you have hell. And I'm telling you that God sent you here for the salvation of my soul, which of course was her focus and what she wanted to do anyway. And, and this devil gives me so much annoyance. If you would take pity on me and let me put my devil back into hell, you would provide a wonderful service to me and God would be so pleased at your service. So it's just such utter manipulation um, of, of, of this young girl who doesn't know what's happening and what's going on. Um, and, and using religion as a means to get to accomplish this, this lust and desire that, that the man became filled with just at seeing her. And she said, since I have hell, let it be whenever it please you. And so he said, let's go put him back so that he will leave me alone. And he placed her on the bed and taught her how to place herself so they could imprison the one that is damned by God. Um, now that kind of has has a, a separate meaning. It's not just the devil, but but the behavior, um, you know, the use of the use of his of his penis to to do this means that that is what's damned by God as well. Um, the young lady who had never before put any devils into hell at first felt some discomfort, and which she told to Rustico, saying, "Father, this devil is a bad guy." Uh, a real enemy of God that even in hell, just as anywhere, he causes pain, which of course is the pain associated with, with having sex for the first time. And, but Rustico assures her, and you kind of wonder how this monk out in the, out in the wild, um, who has been praying all his life knows this, but my dear, it will not always be like that. And to prevent this from happening anymore, Six times did they put the devil back into hell before going to bed until they had exhausted the devil's willing wickedness and he willingly went back to rest. So, hang on a second. So that is, um, that is one of the stories of lust, but I like to, I, I, this is one that I teach my students because it's um, not just about lust, but it also comments on religion and, and behavior of religious persons um, in, in the society. And so um, I think that it, uh, it uh, shows a good example of not love, but just lust and what it can do to someone who loves God and is trying to learn a better way to love God. Um, so in the end, to, to finish out the story in the end, they go through, um, they go through and she decides that, that she wants to put that devil back into hell a whole lot more than he wants the devil to be put back into hell. And um, she continues to encourage it and encourage it and encourage it um, because she likes doing this to please God. And um, then finally Rustico gets, um, he just gets too tired of it. He just, he just can't keep putting that devil back into hell. The devil won't come out to put him back into hell um, as, as you finish on in the story. Uh, so I think that, I think that um, he kind of got his comeuppance when, when he could no longer, he kind of, he kind of created a monster that he couldn't control. And um at the end of the story, it turns out that it's one of those let's tie it all up neatly sorts of things where her, her father and her whole family and is killed in a fire and a young man comes to find her so that he can claim all of her wealth since she um, encouraged, since um, she inherited everything as the only living child. And so he comes and takes her away to marry her and she starts telling the women in the town about this and they just... They just have a hoot about it because these are women who have been married and they understand perfectly well um, what the hermit was doing. And um, and they uh, uh, so it's, it became a phrase, apparently, in that town uh, where they would say, let's go put the devil in hell. Um, so so that's the story that I picked about lust and what it'll do. And nobody really I mean, she is taken advantage of and and. Um, and that is, of course, that's not a good thing to be taken advantage of, but she remains innocent through, through all of it. She never realizes that she's cheating or doing anything she shouldn't be doing, um, because she listened to the, the, the hermit, to the monk and, and did what he said. 
so you, you have any questions about it? Anything you want to comment or talk about it, the story? I, I read that one before um, many years ago and just hearing, you know, the details again, it's hilarious. Like it's very cleverly written. Um, yes. And like you said, it does give you some commentary on issues that I think were going to be brought out later in the Renaissance with the Reformation mm -hmm. that holy people were not always viewed upon as holy. So, and we find that today still. And, the, and, and, and again, that's one of the things that I love about this stuff is to see how human nature kind of keeps, keeps rolling on and rebounding and redoing the same sorts of things. Absolutely. So um, it's, uh, uh, I have always, I think it's funny. Um, and um, in the end, nobody is really hurt. You know, the, the nothing happens to the monk and she gets married and goes on and continues to put a devil in hell for the rest of her life. And, you know, it's, it's, but I, for the first time this year, um, I had a student who was very upset by the story. And um, because she felt that it was a rape story. I'm and, there too. Yeah, I, I mean, and I had just, I mean, I understand that it is, but I guess I had always looked at it from a different perspective. And, and but she was very upset. So we had to have a, a, a good talk in class about, about why they had to read it and, and you know, um, what the purpose of writing it was. Um, I mean, when you, when you figure that at the time you have the art of courtly love, um, the text that tells you that um, you should behave one way if, if the person you love is of a higher rank, but if, if, if she's of a lower rank, you can, you just, you know, uh, tell her what she wants to hear, string her along. And then when you get her into a place where there's nobody else around, you can do what you want to, to her. And, and so that's one of the, one of the rules of love that people are supposed to follow at the time. And so what, what text is that one in? It's called uh, De Anessa Amore. It's, it's the um, Art of Courtly Love uh, by Capilanus. I do think that I removed, personally, I removed this story from my modern, my modern viewpoint. If someone told me this story modernly between mm. them and a priest, I would definitely think it was sexual assault, right? Right. Um, but because I just viewed this as a literary device, like just stories mm -hmm. i did not look at it like that but i can totally see why that would disturb someone who was actually looking at it as these are people real people a real situation mm -hmm. um and yeah that's a fine line so i'm glad you were able to talk with that with that young lady and, and discuss you know the implications of what happened through a modern lens as well right yeah and and i was glad she brought it up because too often they'll stop and and they won't because I teach online. And so too often they will, you know, they just don't say anything. So I'm glad that she did say something and we could talk about it because again, like you, I was, I wasn't looking at it from a, from a modern perspective when I read it. And, and I, um, uh, I thought that it was, I also connected it to the Fablio. Um, the, the Fablio are the kind of the dirty stories that were told, uh, the first ones that I, I mean, they've been around forever, but the, the first ones that I remember are some of the ones in the Canterbury Tales. And um, they, uh, uh, they're just basically dirty stories. They're cheating and they're, they're lying and they're doing all these sorts of things. And when you step back, you realize that that's actually what people do, you know, and, and that's where the realism comes in um, with, with some of these. So, um, Okay, was there a question from, from Aurelia? I just, I saw the chat box flash. Oh, she was just making a comment that it's funny, but kind of icky at the same time. Let's see. It's funny, but kind of icky at the same time. Yes, it, it is. Um, uh, and again, you, you think of this young girl who goes through all of her life and doesn't realize she's ever been taken advantage of. Um, and as I said at the beginning, one of the reasons why I love these, I, why I read these stories and, and enjoy them is because people are, get impressions of other people based on the stories that are told about them. 
who tell the stories about the people who aren't in power and and that shows how they how they um um how other people view them so you get the powerful people and they start saying that that certain people behave this way certain people are responsible for this women are responsible for sin women should do this because the men are in charge then you're forming an idea of woman based on what men have to say and um again chaucer is is great at that with the 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 wife of bath is is just an incredible character to do that sort of thing and and um boccaccio does it too throughout throughout here um, throughout this this story. There are a hundred stories. I'm only talking about two of them. So <laughs> there are lots of different ways, lots of different stories there to look at. And most of them relate to love in some way. Um, and sometimes the woman gets it over on the man. Sometimes the man, man gets it over on the woman, um, but uh, they're very realistic. So um, anyway, that's like I said, I, I love these stories. So, um, all right. So let me let me talk to you about um, the story of Gizmonda and Giscardo and Tancred. Um, this is the first novel of the um, fourth day, and um, it's a sad story. It, it's a it's a tragedy. It's a very sad story. So to set it up, um, G uh, Tancred's daughter Gizmonda was the light of his life. He loved her, he loved her so dearly. And um, he, had, she married later because he just didn't want to let her go. But she did marry and she went away for a while with her husband and she lived a regular married life. And then he died very, very shortly into the marriage. And so home she came to dad. Um, and, and again, he doted on her, he adored her, he loved her. And um, um, he, uh, but she had been married and she wanted to find a partner. She wanted to find somebody who, who she could be with, who she respected, who she loved. Um, nobody, according to her dad, was good enough for her. And um, so she was kind of left as this widow, someone who knew what love was about, um, who desired to continue. Um, having those kinds of relationships, but she couldn't do anything because no one was good enough, according to her dad. So she, she looked at men herself. She decided to choose for herself. And she looked at men and um, she found one who was named Giscardo. And Giscardo was, was a squire in the, in the service of, of her father. And, um, and he was a good man. He wasn't, um, he wasn't royal. He wasn't of high class or standing, but he was a good man. He was a perfect, good human being in everything that she could she could see. And so they worked very, very hard um, to keep their relationship a secret because he, he, he returned her affections and they worked very hard to keep their relationship a secret. And um, in fact, they would uh, they would meet in a garden. There was a there was a, a secret door off of her bedroom. And so, and then she would bring him up to her bedroom um, when she was supposed to be doing something else and no one would bother her. So one day when she was, when she brought him up to her bedroom, her father had come looking for her while she was down in the garden waiting for him. And um, he had fallen asleep at the foot of her bed covered in a blanket. And um, he, so they came up and, and they were in the bed and they were enjoying themselves and, um, the father woke up and saw what was happening. And he didn't say anything at the time, but he, um, after they finished and left, he left and he decided that he was going to punish Giscardo. Um, so he arrested Giscardo trying to find out what, what had happened, what was going on, and, and he wouldn't tell him anything. Um, so he then uh, brought in um, his daughter, Gizmonda, and, and he asked her what was going on. And, and she admitted to the relationship and, and, but said, I didn't, I didn't do anything that would harm you. I didn't do anything that would, um, that would make you um, look bad in anyone's eyes. And so what I wanted to show you was, was this speech that, that Gizmonda gives, because in my mind, especially for that time, when you've read a lot of the literature from that time, this speech speaks so much to 
who women are and what they feel and how men should look at them that I think it's really important to see. So I'm going to bring up the speech and go over the speech with you guys. I'm sorry, it's a little long, but um, I, I think it's really important to kind of understanding uh, that all of, that women had all of these feelings and, and things inside of them that they often weren't allowed to express because of, of the, the culture. So just a minute and I will um, share that. Okay, so we're going to go back up here. And this is the speech. It is kind of long, but it, it really does, it really is, I, I don't know, I'll let you, we'll talk about it after we read it because it, this really affects me. Um, so she says, Tancred, and that of course is her father, your accusation I shall not deny, nor will I cry you mercy. For naught should I gain by denial, nor aught would I gain by supplication. Nay more, there is naught that I will do to conciliate thy humanity and love. My only care is to confess the truth, to defend my honor by words of sound reason, and then by deeds most resolute to give effect to the promptings of my high soul. So she's, she's talking about her honor, and she's also talking about reasoning with him, which is, again, not something that, that you think of women as doing at the time as, as, as reasoning. Um, True it is that I have loved and love Giscardo, and during the brief while I have yet to live shall love him. Nor after death, so there be then love, shall I cease to love him. But that I love him is not imputable to my womanly frailty so much as to the little zeal thou shewest me for my bestowal in marriage and to Giscardo's own worth. So she's saying that it's not the fact that she's a weak woman. It's that her father would not send, give her a, a marriage or relationship with somebody else and how worthy he was to receive her love. It should not have escaped thee, Tancred, creature of flesh and blood as thou art that thy daughter was also a creature of flesh and blood and not of stone or iron. It was and is the duty to bear in mind, old though thou art, that nature and the might of the laws to which youth is subject. And though thou hast spent part of thy best years in martial exercises, thou shouldst nevertheless have been ignorant how, how potent it is the influence even upon the aged to say nothing of the young of ease and luxury. And not only am I, as being thy daughter, a creature of flesh and blood, just like you, um, but my life is not so far spent, but that I am still young and thus doubly fraught with fleshly appetite, and the, and the vehemence whereof is marvelously enhanced by reason that having been married, I have known the pleasure that ensues upon the satisfaction of such desires. Again, just to stop that. I love the way that th these things are described and 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 spoken about. Um, it, it just it just really adds adds to them to me. It adds an, it adds another level um, up to all of it. Um, but basically, she's just saying that you're flesh and blood. I'm flesh and blood. Why should my flesh and blood have different feelings than your flesh and blood has? Um, let's see, where was I? Which forces being powerless to withstand, I did but act as was natural in a young woman, when I gave way to them and yielded myself to love. It's only natural to love. That's, that's what people do. Um, nor in sooth did I, fall to the utmost, did I fail to the utmost of my power so to order the indulgence of my natural propensity that my sin should bring shame neither upon thee nor upon me. So she didn't just find somebody, have the hots for him and fall into bed with him. She didn't do anything that would that would have have um, made cause shame or brought shame upon her father or her. Um, to which end, love and his pity and front fortune in a friendly mood, found and discovered to me a secret way whereby, none witting, I attain my desire. Okay. This from whomsoever thou hast learned it, howsoever thou hast come to know it, I deny not. So she's saying she doesn't know who told him about it, how he learned about it, but um, uh, she's not going to deny what she did. She didn't do anything wrong. It was not at random, as many women do, that I loved Giscardo, but by deliberate choice, I preferred him before all other men. And of determinate forethought, I lured him to my love, 
whereof through his and my discretion and constancy, I have long had joyance. Wherein it would seem that thou, following rather the opinion of the vulgar than the dictates of truth, find cause to chide me more severely than in If thou wouldst not have been vexed, had my choice fallen on a nobleman, thou complainest that I would have, have foregathered with a man of low condition. And dost not thou see that therein thou censurest not my fault, but that of fortune, which not seldom raises the unworthy to high place and leaves the worthiest in low estate. Um, so she continues on this, and I'm not going to, uh, you know, I'm not going to read it out loud to you, but um, this is, uh, um, it, let me, let me go to the end. Let's see. If in thy extreme old age thou art minded to manifest a harshness unwanted in thy youth, wreak thy harshness on me, resolved as I am to cry thee no mercy, prime cause as I am that this sin, if sin it be, has been committed. For of this I warrant thee that as thou mayest have done or shalt do to Guiscardo, if to me thou do not do the like, I with my own hand will do it. Um, so, so this is... Um, um, the speech that to me is so it just says so much about women and and the way they were looked at and and the control that people had over them but it also shows a very strong woman who is standing up and she is taking her um she is taking her control she she decided what she was going to do she looked at all aspects of it and um so she has sense and she has a mind and she is able to reason and, and that kind of goes against a lot of the stereotypes of the time of women. Um, so just to tell the end of the story, um, her father, of course, that, that it does not move him. Her, her beautiful speech doesn't move him. Um, and so he, he kills Giscardo and he sends her a, a goblet with his heart in it. And um, when she sees the heart, she knows that Giscardo is dead. And so she pours poison on it and then she drinks the poison out of the goblet and she dies. And so Tancred is left alone and, and he has lost the one thing that he loved the most in life. And so everybody in this story loses. Everybody, um, everybody, everybody either dies or they lose the things that's most important to them. So any thoughts on that? It's just so sad. <laughs> it, it is. Um, it, it's very sad. It, she, takes, she takes such control um, but in the end, just, and, and Chaucer did this with the wife of Bath too. In the end, she's not going to change anything because of who she is and where she is and, and, and her, her gender and her standing, she's not going to be able to change it. But I, I feel that in the end, by standing up and following through with what she did and, and, choosing to be with the one she loved rather than living without him um she um she does win in a way um uh, it's kind of convoluted but she does win in a way um and there are other stories that you can see that are that, that you can see um th there are other stories on that theme that you can find in in the literature but uh this one really has always really just kind of spoken to me I don't think that this is one that I've read before. Um, I haven't ever read it all the way through. I've just read bits and pieces at certain times, or if someone writes a blog post on one, I'll go and read it. Um, but this one, it's interesting that in, you know, in the story, there is a woman's voice that is mm. strong and that speaks to the character of women and that stands up for, you know, a lot of the misogyny that was going on at the time. Or the right. still goes on, I guess. Yeah. Um, but that still, like you said, that it didn't matter. And that was true at the time. Even if you were a strong woman who spoke up for women, you couldn't you couldn't change the tide of the misogyny at the time and, and on all in all levels of society. Um, so that's why to me this is just a very sad story. It is it reminds I, me of I, their reality. Of what? It reminds me of the reality of being a woman at that time, you know, and how hard it, it must have been. Yes. And, and again, I, I love, I, and I mentioned this again also at the very beginning, but I love the fact that you can have a man who is living in that time 
who is immersed in those that culture who can write a woman's voice so beautifully and so honestly um i i think that that that's just incredible um and i i think again chaucer does the same thing but but they understand both of them understand that their their heroine cannot win you know but but that they can write those so well um is uh just really incredible agreed and what when were the canterbury tales written um they were written in about the same time but a little bit i think they were written right about the same time about the mid 1300s okay i, I could be wrong but the, this was written 13 um 13 um between 1348 and 1353 and um it was published in 1353 so i i'm thinking they're about the same time but i'd, I'd have to look it up okay um then there is let's see Oh, okay. That's that's interesting. Um, there is another one, and and I am so blanking on on the name, and I, it's it's very embarrassing because I should know it. I've written about her. Um, oh, Griselda. Have you have you seen the story of Griselda? Have mm. you heard the story of Griselda? Remind me of the basic plot, because maybe. But yeah, Griselda, Griselda is is written about a lot, so you'll find a lot of. Oh. But she she is in she is in the Decameron as well, and so I have written about the two of them and and compared and contrasted their voices, because Griselda is the one who married um, a man who didn't want to get married, and so he treated her horribly. And when they had children, um, um, he, he sent the children away and told her he killed them because he didn't want the children. And then finally, and this is kind of all condensed, but then finally he sent her away um, because he was going to marry somebody else. And throughout all of this, she took everything he did to her. She just took it without complaint because that was what a wife was supposed to do. And so when he kicked her out of his house with, with naked or with a shift, depending on the story, she took it and she just she just left. And so then he said um, when he went to marry somebody, he actually was bringing back their daughter um, and he wasn't going to really marry her. He was bringing back the daughter because for all of these years until his daughter was of marriageable age, he had been testing her testing her to see if she was a true good wife. And so he brings her back to serve his betrothed. And she comes back and serves the woman that she has been kicked out for. And, um, and then of course, then at the end, when he reveals what happened to that, her daughter and her son are alive and, you know, and everyone lives happily ever after. And, um, the, the the women are are so different the two women are so different that um i i like to to compare and contrast them but i didn't talk about her here because it wasn't there was no love in that story at all <laughs> so, no. i don't think lust. i read that one i i don't no. think i would like to read that one but i i think i will go and read it just to like get the gist of maybe the the point of that one um well, this one, um, um, Gizmonda is um, book book four, novel one. Um, uh, Griselda is at the end. I don't remember which one exactly um, it was. Um, Aurelia so, is mentioning a funny one over in the comments. Um, she says, this story reminds me of another one in the Decameron where a woman is caught with her lover and is going to be executed according to the law and defends herself by arguing that since she always had sex with her husband when he wanted, so when she had sex with her lover, which she did only because she loved him, she was only giving her lover the extra sex, which would have gone to waste, and was found not guilty as a result. I did, I read that one. That one is is also funny to me, and I didn't see you had the, some other chats there, so I'm going to read that, because you said there's a... Um, a podcast. a podcast i should listen to that especially when, when i'm hiking up here i can just listen to it while i'm hiking <laughs> yeah thank you for letting us know about that um I, i'm just trying to get into podcasts i've never really listened to any of them but um I'm, i'll go ahead I'm, and read the comments since i don't believe the comments are recorded so 
Okay. Um, as a side note, there's a really wonderful podcast by Gwen Birch David called Bitching About the Decameron, where she reads through the entire Decameron, except for a few stories that she noped out of and discusses at the end, with sides for historical context and to occasionally say, really? When that is called for. <laughs> that sounds like fun. Um, so, so that is, um, that part of why I love this is, is this this literature in this time is um, is just looking at, at the cleverness of a lot of it and um, these fablio um, that uh, that you find and, and I found them first in the Canterbury Tales with like the Miller story and things like that um, but the, these are just great if people would just you know read them more often <laughs> so um, so anyway, um, any other other questions or? Um... No, I think um, I just want to say thank you. Oh sure, I don't know well, if thank I really you for visiting. Well, and I think we're about ten minutes out from time, so yeah, um, perfect. Um, if there's not more questions, I will hit stop recording. Okay. Thank you.